Criminal Docket Case 618342 entitled State of Ohio versus George C. Brinkman. President in court is defendant Mr. Brinkman with his attorneys, Mr. Thomas Conway, Mr. Fernando Mack, President representing the State of Ohio, uh, the uh, County Prosecutor, Mr. Michael O'Malley, Assistant County Prosecutor, Sal Abadala, and Christopher Schroeder. Uh, we're set today for sentencing on a prior date in court. This three judge panel. After hearing evidence presented by the state of Ohio with respect to uh, the aggravating circumstances and the mitigating factors uh, presented by defense, found this defendant uh, guilty beyond reasonable doubt of the aggravated murders and related counts. Uh, we also considered in the sentencing phase the uh, necessary factors with respect to the death penalty, and now we're ready to proceed with the sentencing hearing. I uh, have the victim's representatives uh, speak. We'll start with the state of Ohio. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, State of Ohio versus uh, George Brinkman, you know, case 618342. Here on June 10, 2017, uh, trust and familiarity turned into treachery, torture, and unspeakable violence uh, when George Brinkman decided uh, to the murder Suzanne and her two daughters Taylor and Kylie. Suzanne, Taylor, and Kylie were brutally murdered uh, by Mr. Brinkman. He killed Suzanne within arm's reach of her two daughters as well as within sight uh, of her two daughters. He then turned and killed Taylor and then killed Kylie, uh, leaving Kylie to witness the murders of her mother and her uh, sister. Uh, we believe the state uh, has provided uh, sufficient evidence um, in the first phase uh, that the aggravating circumstances, or the second phase that the aggravating circumstances outweigh the mitigating factors. And we uh, again ask that the death sentence be imposed um, at the appropriate time. This time around, um, and I believe uh, the panel has made that determination um, as to each and each uh, murder. So we should we be asking for the death sentence for uh, Suzanne's murder, for Kylie's murder, as well as for Taylor's murder. Um, at this time, Your Honor, if the uh, court will allow uh, the, uh, and I know the court has made a determination already that the aggravating circumstances do outweigh the mitigating factors, having deliberated uh, uh, on a prior date, uh, but uh, at this time we ask that the uh, panel hear from uh, the father of the two uh, uh, daughters, uh, Taylor and Kylie, uh, that would be uh, Brian uh, Piper. Pfeiffer, P-I-F-E-R. Your Honors, my name is Brian Pfeiffer. I am and forever will be Taylor and Kylie's dad. For nearly a year and a half now, I've been attending all of these pretrial hearings, reading all of the motions filed by the defendant each arguing that he has specific rights. He has a right to representation. He has a right to postpone the trial so his attorneys can be adequately prepared. He has a right to hire an expert witness to argue some form of mitigation. He has a right to not have anyone talk to him while he's in prison in case he says anything he shouldn't say. We even had to hear how he needed a haircut. But today I'm asking you honorable judges to be the voices for the rights taken by Mr. George Brinkman Jr. The right of Taylor to finish her last year at Kent State University. The right of Taylor to graduate, to get a job in the fashion industry, that she was so passionate about, 
to get her first apartment, her first car, her first house, Taylor's right to get married, to have children, to celebrate the holidays, her right to play another game of softball and sing in the car and go to concerts. Kylie's right to become a forensic scientist that she always wanted to be, to finish her education at BGSU and to get her master's that she had planned on. Her right to go see the theater again and see Phantom of the Opera, that was her favorite. To go shopping in Soho again, to get the New York City apartment that she always wanted. The right to make her artwork and send it to me in stages asking for my feedback. The right to sing with her sister in the car and correct her on the lyrics to the songs. Her right to get married and to have children. And all of our rights to be a part of those things. The rhetoric used by the defense in the entire second half of these proceedings was meant to diminish the impact of the crimes, referring to them as a situation, an event, an incident. That is not accepting responsibility for what you have done. The reality is that George Brinkman Jr. took from all three of them the very right to breathe when he carried out his plan last June. When he brutally murdered Taylor, Kylie, and Suzanne. When he bound them, murdering them one by one. He didn't show any mercy. Yet, he has the audacity to ask this court, you, for mercy on him. They didn't deserve this. That's why today I'm asking you to be the three voices for the three lost. I'm asking you to remember all the testimony that you've heard and all the rights Mr. Brinkman ripped from them, from all of us. In his unsworn statement to the court, he acknowledged that he deserved to be sentenced to death. The simple question before this panel at least in my simple mind, is this. Would the world be a better place without George Brinkman Jr. in it? I believe, as does the whole family, that the resounding answer to that is yes. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Your Honor. Your Honor, at this time, Your Honor, uh, Suzanne Taylor's mother, Ms. Marsha Taylor, I'd like to address the panel. Go yes. And she uh, will be uh, brought up to the podium. And uh, Ms. Kennedy from our office, our victim advocate, will be uh, reading. Her seat. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy, can you state? Uh, Yes. I'm reading the victim impact statement of Marcia Taylor, spelled M-A-R-C-I-A. -A. She is the mother of Susan <coughs> Taylor, grandmother of Taylor Pfeiffer and Kylie Pfeiffer. Suzanne was a 45-year-old, hardworking single mother. Taylor, 21, was a junior at Kent State and Kylie was only 18 years old and a freshman at Bowling Green State University. All three women were involved in softball and coaching and they had many, many friends and people who loved them. The defendant took my family away from me and tore my heart out. The manner in which they were killed was extremely violent. It hurts to know that two of the women possibly witnessed the other's murder. Why did the defendant cut Suzanne's hair? 
what made him go from a friend to a cold-blooded murderer? So many questions go unanswered. I had to be hospitalized because from the day of the murders, my health took a nosedive. I have post-traumatic stress syndrome, major depression, and I'm not able to sleep or eat well. <coughs> I'm under the care of a psychiatrist. I'll never ever get over it. If I didn't have my son, Ken, there would be no reason to live. I'm heartbroken. In closing, I believe the defendant should get the death penalty. It's only fair that his life be taken as he cut short the lives of Suzanne, Taylor, and Kyle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Ruth. At this point, the state, uh, we'd just like to highlight and the, uh, the events of June 10th and 11th going to the 12th would have been much worse had, had it not been for the uh, the actions and, and the uh, involvement of uh, and, and the reason we're here today <clears throat> with this result, I believe, uh, the result of the hard work of the North Royalton uh, Police Department, specifically uh, Detective Skozin and Sergeant Rubicki, um, as well as the assistance and, and it's really an interagency inter cooperation here, the assistance of the FBI, <coughs> Special Agents Andy Earl, and Kerry McCaffrey really uh, dug in that first uh, 24, 48 hours uh, to get us to where we're at here. Uh, with the assistance from BCI, uh, Justin Soroka, and as, uh, of course the uh, technical expert assistance from the, our own Cuyahoga County Medical Examiner's Office and Regional Crime Lab, Dr. Andrea McCollum, uh, Dr. Butt, uh, Kerry Bauschu, <coughs> Lisa Propesny from the Trace Department. Um, and finally, Your Honor, I'd like to thank my colleagues, uh, Dan Cleary, uh, Kevin Brinkman, Chris Schroeder, um, as well as our county uh, prosecutor uh, for giving us the resources uh, to us to pursue this case. Thank you very much. Please support. Mr. Brinkman is not going to speak this morning. Uh, and with all due respect, we're asking the court to reconsider uh, your sentence and impose a sentence of life without the possibility of parole. Uh, for all the reasons previously stated during our closing arguments and mitigation phase, we still believe that the aggravating circumstances do not outweigh mitigating factors presented to this court. We just wanted to highlight, we ask that you consider this acceptance of responsibility early on in this case. And throughout all stages of the case, he always demonstrated the willingness to enter a plea of guilty without the possibility of parole. And the fact that he did enter a plea of guilty and did not drag the family through a trial should weigh heavily uh, before this court. Uh, his genuine remorse articulated through the interviews, letters, and his unsworn statement. We asked the court to consider his lack of violent history, his limited criminal history. We also asked you to consider the abusive relationship at the hands of his father that was testified uh, by our witnesses. And we asked the court to consider the severe depression stemming from the loss of his mother and his brother. And I uh, went through the state's sentencing memorandum. I know that it was argued that that's a weak factor, but we beg to differ. It's a factor that should be weighed uh, heavily. People take their own lives every day in this country based on severe depression. And it can influence behavior. But again, there's no excuse for Mr. Brinkman's behavior, and it's not to be looked upon as an excuse. We also asked the court to consider uh, what he was going through physically, the appearance that uh, was conveyed by witnesses of his lost weight, uh, his diabetes, and how when he didn't take his medication, that can impact uh, his state of mind and his behavior. And based on his history and his characteristics, uh, we know that his behavior demonstrated, uh, as long as it was on this day, was aberrant based on his history and his characteristics. And we are respectfully uh, asking the court to consider what Mr. Aiken had to say in terms of whether or not he poses a risk uh, to uh, a future risk to inmates and staff where he knows he's going to have to be uh, for a long time. We are respectfully asking the court to impose a sentence of life without the possibility of parole. 
Uh, we also ask the court to, on the underlying offenses, to run those offenses concurrent with one another based on the purposes and principles of sentencing. Uh, consecutive sentences are unwarranted and unreasonable under these circumstances, especially if the court still chooses to impose a sentence of death, three separate death verdicts. And uh, that's respectfully our request. Thank you. Mr. Brinkman, is there anything you'd like to tell the court? No, sir. Anything further from the state? No, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Uh, there is an agreement between the parties with respect to allied offenses. Is that correct? There is, Your Honor. We agree with uh, what's articulated in the system. So, count one, aggravated murder. The victim being Suzanne Taylor and count two, aggravated murder, will our ally emerge, is that correct, Mr. Schroeder? Yes, Your Honor. The state elects one will have to proceed to sentencing on count one. And with respect to count three and count four, aggravated murder, with respect to the victim, Taylor Lynn Pfeiffer. Those will both merge as well, Your Honor, and we will like to proceed on count three. And counts five and six, aggravated murder, respect to the victim, Kylie Elizabeth Pfeiffer. Those two counts will merge as well, Your Honors, and we'd like to proceed on count five. Any other issues of allied offenses? No, Your Honor. Is there any objection to that from the defense? No, Your Honor. All right, first of all, um, on behalf of this panel, uh, we'd like to extend our sincere condolences to the family members who are here. Uh, who have uh, been present and active throughout this entire very long and, I'm, as I heard, often frustrating process. Our, our laws are made to protect the rights of those accused, and we have sworn an oath, everyone, the attorneys, the judges, to protect those rights. And uh, that's often cold comfort to the victim's family members who have lost a member of their family forever. Uh, and all those efforts defense makes protecting the rights of the defendant just uh, fall on deaf ears and are often upsetting to the family members. We understand that. We appreciate uh, how you've acted throughout these proceedings. Uh, we understand your feelings, and it's uh, every case in which an innocent person loses their life is always senseless. There's never any sense to it, and there will never be any sense found in it or any good reason for it. Uh, and uh, all the law can do is what the legislature has allowed us to do. And we have considered all these factors. Uh, we have <laughs> made specific findings beyond a reasonable doubt that this defendant <coughs> is the principal offender uh, in the aggravated murder, that the aggravated circumstances outweigh the mitigating factors. And pursuant to the revised code section 2929.03, we do hereby impose the death penalty and count one, and count three, and count five for those aggravated murders. No sentence will be imposed in count two, four, or six pursuant to the allied offenses agreed to by the parties. The remaining underlying allegations, the court has considered all the principles and purposes of felony sentencing, all the appropriate recidivism and standards. <coughs> as required by our sentencing statutes. Also, we have considered, I have considered specifically whether or not consecutive prison sentences are appropriate. Hereby, I do find that the facts and circumstances surrounding these brutal murders carried out with pre-calculation and design and the underlying offenses, 
they're part and parcel of this plan require consecutive sentences. It is necessary to protect our community and to punish this defendant. Consecutive sentences are not disproportionate to the harm that was caused in this manner. That the harm is so great or unusual, single term does not adequately reflect the seriousness of this defendant's conduct. <coughs> so the court's going to impose the following sentences. In count seven, aggravated burglary, it's a felony of the first degree, 11 years during a correctional institution. In count eight, it's kidnapping. With respect to victim Suzanne Taylor, it's a felony of the first degree. 11 years in Marine Correctional Institution. In count 11, which is gross abuse of the corpse, with respect to victim Suzanne Taylor, 12 months in Marine Correctional Institution, that's a felony in the fifth degree. In count 9, kidnapping, with respect to victim Taylor Lynn Pfeiffer, 11 years in Marine Correctional Institution, for that felony in the first degree. In count 12, a gross abuse of the corpse, respect to victim Taylor Lynn Piper, 12 months in Marine Correctional Institution. In count 10, kidnapping, with respect to victim Kylie Elizabeth Piper, felony <coughs> first degree, 11 years in Marine Correctional Institution. In count 13, gross abuse of the corpse, with respect to victim Kylie Elizabeth Piper, 12 months in Marine Correctional Institution. Sentence will run consecutive each other, count seven, consecutive to eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and 13, 47 years of learning correction institution. Your Honor, I'll do that yes. now. We're also uh, opposing 
for us. So it's discretionary with respect to the fellows of the fifth degree, so the record is absolutely clear if that ever becomes an issue. Uh, three years discretionary post-release control on the F5s, mandatory five years post-release control on the F1s. Uh, State of Ohio also has a final request. Your Honor, um, I would request that uh, since the uh, Mr. Franklin has been uh, sentenced to, uh, to death, and upon the filing of the uh, of the opinion that a, uh, uh, an execution date be set uh, by the court um, uh, within within the year, um, I we understand that there's appeals uh, that will stay that, but uh, I believe that that's a, a practice, uh, if not required by the statute, that that, set, that an execution date be set by this trial uh, court. Thank you. All right. Uh, the anything from the defense? No, <coughs>
Your Honor, on behalf of Mr. Brinkman, uh, like the court, you have advised him of his appellate rights uh, to these proceedings. We have also advised him of his rights uh, and the pros and cons of appealing this uh, matter. And Mr. Brinkman has made it clear to us, as he has early on in this case, that he does not wish to appeal your decision. Mr. Brinkman, is that correct? That is a true statement, sir. Have you had enough opportunity to talk to your attorneys about <coughs> what the appeal entails and how it will proceed? Yes, sir. Do you have any questions about that for this panel? No, sir. Okay. Uh, pursuant to our, our statutory duty at this point, uh, and having considered what defendant's wishes are, uh, the court is going to appoint appellate counsel uh, so that uh, if there is any possibility of uh, this defendant uh, wishing to pursue specific issues uh, that may may occur to a, a counsel, we will appoint the State Public Defender's Office uh, and uh, another attorney uh, with respect to an appeal. Also, the State of Ohio has a request as well for the sentencing date? Yes, sir. Uh, considering that the sentence uh, is not final judgment until our opinion has been filed with the clerk's office, uh, I'll set the execution date for January the 15th, 2020, which will be one year from when approximately the, uh, the sentencing memorandum and opinion would, be, have, would have been filed. Is there anything else for the record from the state of Ohio? Two things very briefly, Judge. Uh, number one, from the date of the defendant's arrest, I believe he is entitled to 564 days of jail time credit, so we'd ask the court to award him that amount. And number two, uh, there was one consecutive sentencing finding that I believe the court did not make, and that was that uh, consecutive sentences are not disproportionate to the danger the offender poses to the public, so we just asked the court to make that finding as well. All right. If I didn't say that, I, I thought I did indicate that, uh, oh, it, that the, the consecutive sentences aren't disproportionate to what happened, and it's also uh, not disproportionate to the danger he does pose. That's correct. I appreciate that. Uh, incorporating all the facts that this panel has heard. The court will grant 564 days jail time credit pursuant to, to law. Is there anything else for the record from the state? There you go. From defense? No, Your Honor. All right, defense, you may have to recess. All right.